I will now finally introduce the celebrated singular value decomposition, or the SVD, which is perhaps rightfully considered to be one of the most important decompositions in linear algebra today. Of course, in my opinion, all decompositions are essential. But then again, every time you do a Google search, calculating the singular value decomposition for some matrix is a key step in determining the search results. So it's hard to argue with the statement that from the application's point of view, the SVD is more important than other decompositions, even including the eigenvalue decomposition. So we'll talk about the applications of the SVD, including Google searches, later on in the course. And in fact, we'll spend a great deal of time talking about the singular value decomposition. But for now, I simply can't resist introducing it because it's just a hop, a skip, and a jump away from this decomposition. Or to be more accurate, it's just a single hop away from this decomposition. So what I'm going to do now is erase the board and show you the SVD, and then we'll talk briefly about some of its fundamental properties. All right, so once again, our starting point is this decomposition. And what I have just written on the board is the eigenvalue decomposition for the symmetric matrix S. And as you recall, symmetric matrices always have full sets of eigenvalues. In the case of this decomposition, the eigenvalues of this matrix are all non-negative. That was our convention in establishing this decomposition. And of course, the eigenvectors of S are either orthogonal or can be chosen to be orthogonal. And in fact, they can be chosen to be orthonormal. So when you form the matrix X, it ends up being orthogonal. And its inverse is its transpose. So what we have here is what the eigenvalue decomposition always looks like for a symmetric matrix, except now we also only have non-negative values on the diagonal of the matrix lambda. And it's important to remember our geometric interpretation of this decomposition, which was rotation, scaling along the coordinate axes, and then the opposite rotation. So we interpreted any symmetric matrix according to this decomposition. Of course, taking half a step back, a symmetric matrix is all about scaling the space along some orthogonal directions. So what this decomposition tells us to do is to think of that orthoscaling transformation as rotation that aligns those directions with the coordinate axes, followed by scaling along the coordinate axes, which is of course represented by a symmetric matrix, excuse me, diagonal matrix, and we're only using scalings without flipping, so all of the numbers on the diagonal are once again positive. And once that step is done, simply rotate the whole thing back so that those orthogonal directions are aligned with their original directions, original configuration. So that's the geometric interpretation of this decomposition. Now, all we need to do to get to the singular value decomposition is simply plug in the eigenvalue decomposition of the symmetric matrix S back into this decomposition. And here's what we end up with. We end up with A equals Q, and then X lambda X transpose. And you can see that what we have here is pretty much the singular value decomposition for the matrix A. Except, of course, when we look at these two matrices, we realize that both of them are orthogonal. The matrix Q was orthogonal by the definition of this decomposition, and the matrix X is orthogonal for reasons we have just discussed. And we have discovered earlier that the product of two orthogonal matrix matrices is itself an orthogonal matrix. So this is also an orthogonal matrix, and we're going to give it a name. We're going to call it Y. So we end up with Y lambda, lambda X inverse. And that right there is the singular value decomposition of the matrix A. In words, according to the singular value decomposition, 
any matrix whatsoever. Right now we're focusing on square matrices, but it'll work for rectangular matrices as well. But for now, for any, any square matrix can be decomposed as a product of an orthogonal matrix times a diagonal matrix times, and I don't have to write the inverse here, I can write transpose because it's an orthogonal matrix, times another orthogonal matrix or the transpose of another orthogonal matrix. So even though it looks similar to the eigenvalue decomposition, this is for a symmetric matrix, this works for an arbitrary matrix. So the first property that we can point out is the universality, whereas the eigenvalue decomposition only exists for matrices with a full set of eigenvalues and no defects this, and, and no complex eigenvalues. This decomposition exists for all square matrices whatsoever. So it is remarkably universal. And of course it inherits its universality from this decomposition. So whatever we said before about the universality of this decomposition, we can once again say about this decomposition. And it's also remarkable that these, both of these matrices are orthogonal. And the fact that we're taking the transpose is a tribute to that. So even when the eigenvalue decomposition is possible, these, the matrix X in the general case ends up rather arbitrary, it doesn't have any special properties. Well, in the case of the SVD, these two matrices, of course they're different, which makes this in a way weaker than the eigenvalue decomposition, more flexible, uh, but they are orthogonal. So that's the second very important property of the singular value decomposition. Finally, maybe not finally, I might take up other things, but again, importantly, this decomposition also has a very straightforward geometric interpretation. In fact, its geometric interpretation is so striking that at first it's hard to believe and takes a little bit of getting used to. Here's their interpretation. It states that any transformation whatsoever is a rotation, possible reflection thrown in, but let's just say for simplicity, rotation, followed by scaling along by positive numbers along the coordinate axes, followed by another rotation. So for a symmetric matrix, it was rotate, scale, and then rotate back. For an arbitrary matrix, it's just a little bit different. It's rotate, scale, and then rotate in some, into some other orientation. So that's the only difference. For a symmetric matrix, it's rotate back to where you started, and here rotate to some new configuration. So in that sense, almost any matrix is sort of like a symmetric matrix. Of course, we saw it here, where we interpreted this as any matrix being what a symmetric matrix would do plus a rotation. So this interpretation is just the derivative of our geometric interpretation of this decomposition. But in any case, it's very powerful. And it shows unequivocally that under linear transformations, any sphere becomes an ellipsoid, any circle becomes an ellipse. Why? Because you start, let's say, with a sphere, let's start in three dimensions, you perform a rotation that keeps the sphere itself. It rotates into itself. Then you stretch it along the coordinate axis. Now it became an ellipsoid. And now you rotate it to some new uh, configuration. And that keeps it an ellipsoid. So under any linear transformation, a sphere becomes an ellipsoid. Nothing else is possible with linear transformations. And now finally, what I want to point out once again, we've talked about it before, but I need to point it out once again, is the power of algebra. Yes, we just interpreted this decomposition geometrically in a very clear and straightforward way. But could we ever come up with that property of arbitrary linear transformations by pure geometric means? Well, I couldn't, and even if it's possible, it's probably not at all easy. Well, with algebra, we never really had more than three or four lines on the board, and everything has been very easy and completely straightforward. So this is a testament to the power of algebra, especially when it's working with geometry. So in any case, here's our singular value decomposition. 
My apologies. I just realized that I forgot to state what the singular values are. Well, the singular values are the non-negative numbers that appear on the diagonal of this matrix lambda. And actually, in the context of the singular value decomposition, this matrix is typically denoted by the capital letter sigma for singular. And the individual singular values are denoted by the lowercase sigma. So the numbers on the diagonal of this diagonal matrix are the singular values. They're denoted by the lowercase sigmas. This matrix itself is usually denoted by capital sigma. And so we can state that the singular values of A are simply the eigenvalues of the matrix S, which appears in this decomposition. Or equivalently, they're the square roots of the eigenvalues of A transpose A. So you can kind of think of the singular values as squaring the matrix A in this actually very natural way, and then taking the square root. Of course, when you take this square, the resulting matrix is symmetric, and all of its eigenvalues are non-negative. So whatever problems A may have had, go away. So we end up with a matrix with a full set of positive eigenvalues, then we take their square roots, and those are the singular values of the matrix A. So there you go. Now our definition is complete. In the next video, we'll use the singular value decomposition to prove that whether you decompose the matrix A into a combination QS or the combination in the opposite order, SQ, that the resulting orthogonal matrices are actually identical, which is what we saw in the one example that we've considered so far. So we'll do that, and then we'll actually uh, say goodbye to the singular value decomposition, only to revisit it in depth later in the course.